Well, hello there, listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Darlene Marshall, and as we're leading into this episode today, I just want to give you a heads up. We're going to talk about things like dieting, diet culture, calorie restriction, weight and its relationship to health, how we eat, our relationship with our food, and kind of everything to do with that. So if you didn't pick that up from the title, this is your heads up that this might not be an episode that you want to listen to if those things are going to mess with your well-being. Because at the end of the day, on this show, we care more about your well-being than we do about our listener numbers. So if you're going to skip this week's episode, let me give you a few suggestions. You might consider going back and listening to the episode on self-compassion in April of 2022. Uh, There's a great episode on bodily autonomy in the fitness and wellness industry that's in June of 22. Or If this topic is bringing some stuff up for you, maybe go check out the interview with Marit Summers, one of my favorite fitness professionals. We've got an episode on weight neutral fitness. That was November of this past year. So there are some options if you need your dose of BTF, but this is not the episode for you. Okay, so let's get to today's episode. You know, I have I unquestionably grew up in like a diet culture family. The people around me were almost always talking about their weight, losing weight, how they were going to lose weight. And it kind of seemed like they were always talking about how either they needed to lose weight or I needed to lose weight from the time, I don't know, I was maybe like 12 years old. And I don't actually really remember a time when it it must have existed. It really must have existed. But a time that I wasn't aware that someone around me was dieting, was trying to change the shape and the size of their body. Now, I've been in the industry for about 12 years, and I noticed something in these last year or two, which is a movement against dieting within fitness that just keeps getting louder and louder. And I get questions probably weekly about different diets, anti-diets, weight, health, how to change weight, um, you know, just it seems like people want to talk a lot about whether or not diets work and how we can frame this conversation around dieting. I don't actually think I'm the best person to fully flesh out that evidence, but I do know somebody who is. And I invited back a friend of the show, one of my favorite people to come on and talk about it. So if you've listened to the birthday takeover episode, you're going to recognize his voice. He is the content development and production manager at NASM. He's one of, which means that he's one of the minds behind all of the courses, the certifications that you take if you are taking an NASM course. He's been in fitness for over 20 years and he's got a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in exercise science, and he's currently getting his doctorate in health science and organizational leadership. So I could not think of a better person to sift through the evidence around dieting, like the real scientific evidence around dieting and help us to make sense of this question do diets actually work? Like the people who are out there saying, oh, diets don't do anything versus the people who are out there just advocating constantly for weight loss and everybody in the middle, how are we supposed to make sense of it as normal people? Well, this guy's going to help us do it. Rich Fami, friend of the pod, welcome back to Better Than Find. Hi, Darlene. Wow, that's um, a lot of pressure. <laughs> Gauntlet thrown. <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, what you got. Yeah, show me what you got, Fami. <laughs> uh, I want to frame for our listeners one more thing. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. It's been inspired by one of my favorite, probably my very favorite podcast, which is Maintenance Phase. And if you've never listened to Maintenance Phase, you should totally go listen to it. You'll love it, I promise. Um, so Rich has prepared a review of evidence and arguments around dieting and diet culture and how we approach it all so that um, he can share that with us. I have not reviewed all of Rich's notes other than to frame the conversation. So I'm going to be learning right along with you from his informed perspective. All right. So are you ready, Rich? I'm ready to go. Let's dive in. Okay. Let's kick it off. Where are we going to start? Well, I I think it's useful to um, frame a few things about how we're going to go through this so people can understand, you know, because there's so much information that I 
and had to sort of leave a lot out. So I tried mm. to narrow my focus so we can get this done in a reasonable amount of time. But no. I think, I think, well, we could do a part two, a part three, a part 36, we whatever might. you think we can do that. I don't know. We'll um, just make it like a, a Huberman Labs episode where it's like five hours of him and Sam Harris arguing about the nature of reality. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Uh, I'm down. Um, so first thing, we'll kind of go through a foundational understanding of, of things that we all pretty much accept about weight loss and, um, you know, having obesity or uh, overweight. And um, because, because there's certain kind of ground rules and foundational concepts that I think we all accept, but let's review those a little bit. And then we'll talk about how that leads to um, the recommendations that public health professionals, healthcare professionals, and um, fitness professionals, um, you know, make around losing weight and why that's the main intervention for a lot of these professionals. Um, and then we'll also uh, talk about the, the complexity, sort of the reality of it, and then what's the right way to think about it. So okay. that's how I'm That thinking. sounds reasonable. And I, you know, just to flame for the listener, part of why I asked you specifically is that with a background in psychology, I feel like you can understand the behavior piece. With a master's in exercise science and a career in fitness, you definitely understand what's happening physiologically. And now you're out there studying public health and leadership, which means the way that messages go from science to us using them is the whole journey of public health and communication. Um, and so I, that's why I could not think of a better person to lead the conversation. And I think there's so many different facets to it that whether you're a lay person or you're a fitness professional, you don't necessarily understand all these different ways that information gets manipulated and misinterpreted. And that's how you end up with some, you know, like 22 year old freshly getting certified out there being like, I don't know what they're talking about. It's just calorie restriction. It's simple, bro. And I feel my blood pressure already starting to rise as I'm making that joke. <laughs> I, I love that you throw in the bro at the end. Bro. <laughs> I've worked in a gym for a long time. I know what it's like. Bro. It's bro. all you, bro. It's all bro. you. I just got I just got my, my fingertips on the bar. Um, yeah, yeah. That's it's what I always think of. Lock out. Yeah. Finish her up. Anyway, you. let's get to it. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so let's talk some foundational stuff. Um, one is for this conversation, we're going to talk about the general population. So we're, we're just talking about a person that is looking to improve their health uh, and well-being. We're not talking about, um, someone who is suffering from morbid obesity where weight loss is their primary intervention right now. So they have more um, serious mental, emotional, and medical interventions that are required for their health and well-being. So that's also the population we don't generally deal with. And if you do deal with that population, I really strongly recommend a, a healthcare provider network that you work with and you're not working with these folks solo. Uh, the we, other population, oh, go ahead. Can, I'm gonna chime in there. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, morbid obesity is a BMI over 40. Yes. And specifically that matters because that is the population where there is a measurable negative health outcome to having weight. People think it is far lower in the BMI threshold. It is morbid obesity and the threshold where weight becomes a medical issue is 40. Okay. Just, That's good. Yeah. We can agree yeah, with then, that. Like, I think it's just so important yes. because people think like, Oh, I just like really need to lose 20 pounds. I must be unhealthy. But weight itself yes. in the absence of other pathology below 40 is not medically compromised. Okay. Can we do you agree? Right. Do you disagree? Right. Do you want to argue about it? I agree. I think we'll actually get into that a little bit too. And, oh, and sorry. we can get into <laughs> no, that's totally great because that actually sets up a big a big chunk of the in conversation. In maintenance phase fashion, yeah. I am jumping ahead. <laughs> that's totally fine. That is totally fine. <laughs> Um, okay, and then go. the other, the other population we won't talk about are athletes that need to yeah. be at specific weights for competition or competitive reasons, because those are uh, extreme examples. And those athletes will also tell you that that is not genuine, uh, generally healthy to do. It's temporary oh, yeah. and just needed for their competition. So, um, another foundational concept is we should accept that a caloric deficit is the requirement for weight loss. Okay. And that is where your energy expenditure is greater than your energy intake. Now that, that comes with a big, however, hmm. however, it is way more complex than that and multifactorial than just eat less, move more. 
Um, a, a, an analogy I like is actually from maintenance phase. It's, it's a basketball analogy and I'm a basketball fan. So this works really well. Um, but yes, to win a game, you need to score more points than the other team, right? That is like a, achieving a caloric deficit. But um, what goes into that is way, com way more complex, right? In terms of offensive strategies, defensive strategies, coaching, player preparedness, what, however many, you know, hundreds of factors go into winning a basketball game. Um, so that's how I like to think about weight loss is, is the idea, yes, you, you know, expend more than, than you intake. Um, but of course it's way more complex than that. Right. I'm so, so glad the next things. I'm so glad that you added not only the basketball analogy, obviously I love maintenance space, but I immediately thought of, um, there's this great anecdote from the Celtics in the eighties. My grandfather was a big Celtics fan, um, where they would like, I think it was that they would heat the side of the court that the, um, the opponents would be playing on the second half of the game so that they would shoot more poorly. <laughs> like there's so many things that go into, you know, like we think about the ball deflating that, that whole scandal, like there's all these little nuanced things where the caloric deficit isn't as simple as just like count your calories and you're done. Um, you're listening to the better than fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlie Marshall. My guest is Rich Fami, and we are answering these questions, this question. Is dieting really that bad? Do diets work? Like what's going on here? So Rich, we've, we've got some foundation setters. There are more foundation to say. Yeah, there, there are a couple other things I think we should acknowledge for, for the science folks out there as well. Um, that metabolic syndrome is the thing, right? So, so metabolic is syndrome is characterized by um, extra adipose tissue, the body fat tissue around the waist, um, reduced activity or sedentary behavior, and it's a cluster of medical conditions, including abnormal cholesterol and triglyceride levels, um, increased risk for type 2 diabetes, heart disease and stroke, um, and high blood pressure as well, and, and higher blood sugar. So that's also related to insulin resistance. That's part of it. So those are the hallmark features of what we consider to be metabolic syndrome. Um, the more conditions you develop, the more your disease risk goes up is the simple relationship. And um, I do want to reiterate it you know, inactivity is part of that. I think we tend to focus on, on diet and nutrition, but inactivity is part of that equation. And there is a relationship with body weight, but I think that relationship is over, the strength of that relationship is overstated, which is part of what drives the interventions that get recommended. Okay, let's talk about this. I think we need to talk mm -hmm. about this. Okay, so metabolic syndrome is your, your metabolism, your body's ability to process energy, right, is somehow compromised. Mm -hmm. And we know it's compromised because you start to have like cardiac issues, right? You said like hypertension, start to have blood sugar issues. So like pre-diabetes, you're getting blood sugar spikes and crashes. You're sitting around a lot because you mentioned sedentary. Um, I think I've had a few clients who've been diagnosed with metabolic syndrome who have not been sedentary. They're active, but they're inconsistent right? There's like some other stuff going on there. Like metabolic syndrome is really complex is kind of what I'm leaning into. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's got this relationship with weight, but it's not causal. It's not like I have weight, therefore I have metabolic syndrome. Right? Right. That's part of the idea. I, th I think what happens too is, is medical professionals get it, um, not get it twisted. That's kind of the funny <laughs> way. To, I guess that's a, one way to put it. Um, but but because weight loss creates improvements in these things, then it's an automatic assumption that weight gain creates these things. Hold on. Um, so, yeah. So you said weight loss creates improvement in metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. Do we know if it's causal or correlative? And for the listener, the difference is, do we know that the weight loss causes the improvement? Or is it that we typically see weight loss in somebody who's improving their metabolic syndrome? It's... I would say it's more correlational, but strongly correlational is probably a good okay. way to put it. Um, is that, you know, when you see weight loss, these things tend get, to fall. Tend to get better. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's not that losing weight improves metabolic syndrome. It's that if I'm doing all the things that improve my metabolism, my weight is probably going to go down eventually. Yes. Yeah. That okay. that's very important that we look at things as our ultimate strategy is a weight neutral approach. It's not that focusing on weight loss improves <laughs> metabolic syndrome. It is a loss of weight physiologically that improves metabolic syndrome. So 
That's I a am very laughing because I feel like we just yeah. gave away the <laughs> it's like yeah. our no. So a little tip behind the hat. If you've been a better than fine uh, listener for a long time, you probably know that we're we're late neutral. Um, but essentially, this is our argument why. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, uh, the punchline. The punchline is a weight neutral approach is the way to go. I, I don't know that people would be surprised by that. So it's okay if the ending is given away because the journey there is worth the wait. Oh, but oh, pun intended. Pun, is that a pun? Oh, I didn't actually intend the pun. But, ah, the yeah, the, I didn't intend it. I didn't intend it. Zing! It you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. We make the jokes here. <laughs> okay, so metabolic syndrome has this whole class of diagnosable, measurable hallmarks that are not weight. Um, I recently had a client who is a soft quotes here, normal weight, um, but has all the hallmarks of metabolic syndrome. Um, so you might have metabolic syndrome and not have elevated weight, but I hear, you know, you've got some cardiac stuff, you've got some blood sugar stuff. We can measure it in your A1C. We can measure it in other metabolic measures. And typically if you're doing all the things that improve metabolic syndrome, your weight will also, I'm going to say go down. Cause I feel like improve is not weight neutral. Like that's not weight neutral language. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I, there's actually an unfortunate term, um, that I was going to bring up later, but you actually brought it up. Well, let's do it. The term, um, when you have someone who is a quote unquote, normal weight, I'm doing air quotes for those yeah, who are just for the listeners. The um, and they, they have, you know, the, the cluster of cardiometabolic stuff that is metabolic syndrome. They are deemed to have metabolic obesity. Right. And, what and I'm a just stupid not phrase. A, I'm, not, <laughs> what a I'm stupid not a fan. Phrase. I'm not a fan of that term because you're, you're <sighs> still you're still calling it something that is related to your weight. But it, it's not because your weight it's is, what? quote unquote, normal on a BMI chart. But you're basically saying your metabolism is suffering from obesity. I don't know how I don't know how to even characterize that, but it's such an unfortunate term. But we're going to I might use it because that's what some of the research refers to it as but then that i'm means actually a, glad that you unpacked yeah. it first because i think i would have started yelling at that would point. you start screaming and then yes and then i will say things that will make our producer upset so <laughs> let's yes. just keep rolling yes. here okay so I'm where do we go Eric. from here okay um so really what so what's the upshot of all this like what, what's the punchline of of all these relationships that we consider out there um, and, and these foundational understandings about weight and weight loss and weight management is that we generally get um, a societal and public health um, perspective that weight loss or weight maintenance or just my weight is, is reduced to individual behavior. Mm. So it is about my inability to maintain what I eat versus expend. And it is just way more complex than that, and which which we'll get into. Um, but but when you default it to human beha behavior as the central problem, then of course the primary intervention becomes lose weight. Yeah, and then right. we wrap all of that up with you know all of this virtue and value and your value as a human being, your ability to regulate yourself. You know, like there are studies showing that people who are a bit higher on the BMI chart make less money. They're conceived mm -hmm. as less um, employable. And so we get mm -hmm. all this other gobbledygook mixed up with that idea that you just described, which is like, oh, it's just your individual behaviors. You clearly just can't control yourself. And that's why your weight is the way it is. And that's just not true. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and we'll get into that a little bit too, but it's, it's, and we're actually about to get into that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I threw in because we're doing a, a teaching, a t we're not really, I don't know, what do you want to call we're it? We're really just doing me getting mad. Exploratory <laughs> episode. Yeah, this is, Eric, can we retitle this to making Darlene bad episode of Better Than Fine? <laughs> um, so I have a funny little, I tried to research where did this focus come from or start or, you know, especially public health and, and, and healthcare. And I found, and I don't know if this is 100% accurate, but this is the best I could find. But in 1949, a group of doctors established something called the National Obesity Society. And it was the credited as being the first organization to take something that was sort of marginalized in terms of treatment, you know, on the fringe, fringe, fringe medicine, right? And bring it mainstream. But one of their key tenets is that they believe that any level of thinness was healthier 
than being overweight and that a thinner you was a healthier you under all circumstances. I am angry on behalf of 15 year old Darlene who was given that message by her caregivers. Um, actually, you'll appreciate this in the statement that I would be better at basketball if I was lighter mm. and, and I am fighting the right, like I keep laughing doing this episode, but it's because my coping strategy for unexpressed anger is to laugh and I am feeling myself get red and the grin climbing to the corners of my eyes as I'm like, <laughs> why? <laughs> There's, um, Rich, are you familiar with the research showing that that statement is just factually false? Um, cause I believe that there is research showing that as we age, when you are lighter, thinner, you're actually have a higher all cause mortality than people who are, you know, a little heavier going into their seventies and eighties because of things like you'll better be able to sustain a fall. Or if you get sick and you lose your appetite because you have got a few more pounds on, you'll actually get through the illness better. Um, are you, were you going to, did I, did I steal it? Did I no. steal your line? No, no, no. <laughs> that wasn't on the menu, but, but, uh, oh my gosh, is that on oh, the Oh man, line? you just terrible. keep ripping them. No, I that love is it. Terrible. Keep going, I didn't, keep going. I didn't mean to do that again. Um, no, it it's perfect. just, I think it's, it's because I'm a dad. It's the dad jokes are intuitive and integral like to my here. speech patterns. Yeah, um, and your identity. I, I am, uh, I'm not very familiar with that research. I do remember research that showed carrying somewhere around 15 to 20 pounds into that stage of life was actually healthier. Yeah. And you. I can't so tell that, you how that's many what I remember women that. in their like 60s, 70s, 80s have hired me and tried to get me to help them lose weight, even though I'm like, no, no, you want to gain as much muscle as possible. Please, please mm -hmm. stop trying to lose right. weight. And that's an important thing too, is we're not necessarily talking about fat weight. Yeah. We're talking about weight. Right. People. You were talking about weight. Yeah. Wait. And so going and back that could to be metabolic muscle syndrome, the positive metabolically active tissue is muscle mm -hmm. and bone density and all these other things that could make you heavier, but actually healthier. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're setting gotta, me up so well. You're going to like, you're going to like what I've got on that. Right. Like well, that. let me, let me just for the listener, you're listening to the better than fine podcast. I'm Darlene Marshall. Our guest and guide is Rich Fami, And we're asking this question. Our diet's really so bad. And if you can't tell by that uptick pitch and the way that I'm turning bright red on the camera, uh, you can probably guess where I'm going, but Rich, please continue. Where are we headed next? All right. All right. Um, I, I think you made a point about, um, social determinants of health. So I think we should we should throw a line in here to expand on that. And um, this is a, a summary um, or a paraphrase of a, of a research study. But but the author essentially said that um, the narrative of individual responsibility. So this it's all reduced to behavior and individual responsibility gobbledygook uh, does not account for the fact that social, economic, environmental, and biological factors have different strength of influence on each person. Ooh, and depending that. on their circumstances and biology. Yeah. So what this means is that your relationship, the relationship between health status and weight status doesn't, it's not uniform. It doesn't hold the same way every time it's tested. So weight and the relationship between weight and health is really more of a spectrum and it's very heterogeneous across the population. Um, so the fact that we always make weight loss, our first intervention does not at all meet the reality of the population. Yeah. So, so think, when you're pushing, mm -hmm. well, this is, I just want to like take that one step further when you hear, and this, you know, this is, I'm talking directly to the listener. When you hear someone talk about weight stigma, weight bias in, especially in medicine, I cannot tell you, and I know I've talked about this on the show before, how many clients I have worked with years after they start going to the doctor for a medical problem. The doctor says, oh, you just need to lose weight. Oh, you just need to lose weight. Oh, you just need to lose weight. And the ball just keeps getting kicked down the field because they're not even bothering to give the tests that they would give a smaller person on the assumption like, oh, it's just because you're fat. And how dehumanizing and unfair and just scientifically inaccurate that strategy is, and that is a current underlying my fury. 
Yeah, that for ap absolutely is true. The um, the default to weight loss by healthcare professionals really does reinforce weight stigma and weight bias. Well, it comes from weight bias and it reinforces weight stigma, and and no, that doesn't help anybody, right? Because most people that go in and they have all these conditions, they're sort of assuming the doctor's going to say, "Hey, you need to lose weight," and but but the best physicians may do sometimes this is not all physicians but in my experience with clients and, and other professionals and people i've worked with over the years it's hey are you exercising exercise some more and watch your diet right and, and that's what it comes down to because they're just assuming it's about um you know my behavior and personal behavior and personal habits so but you know like i said there's all kinds of things that make it um more complex and, and pushing weight loss as that strategy really does a disservice to someone because, because so many other factors are at play that, um, you know, that, that wake up call air quotes again from the physician really isn't mm -hmm. the way to go. Right. Um, so I, I figured we'd talk a little bit about, you know, I keep saying it's more complex and, and kind of there's two things I landed on that I think, um, make it more complex and, um, one of them we've already been talking about. It's just that, that weight is in a spectrum, right? And, and weight, the relationship between weight and health is a spectrum that there are people that are quote unquote, normal weight that exhibit all of the signs of metabolic syndrome. Uh, on the flip side of that, there are people that would, that are obese BMI over 40 based on the clinical definition definition that do not have metabolic syndrome they may have zero to one pieces of metabolic syndrome, but not enough to call it that, but they are metabolically healthy and obese. Yeah. Um, there's even a 5%, you know, it's a very small percentage, but there is 5% of people who are obese are not only metabolically healthy, but they have zero conditions related to metabolic syndrome and their insulin resistance is completely normal. So their insulin, mm -hmm. the way we do, they, they work with insulin and blood sugars, totally normal. The ranges of people that are metabolically healthy overall and are obese, um, I've seen different ranges. I've seen ranges somewhere in the realm of one third to one half. So I don't, there's no conclusive number. Um, but the, the point is there are more people who are overweight, uh, or what they, they have obesity or overweight and, um, are metabolically actually just fine. Um, the, the one thing though, that the research did show as a pattern is it's, uh, it's that spectrum I'm talking about that, you know, there's sort of three, um, landmarks, I guess you'd say along, along, along the research or the, the distribution of the population. One is someone who is classified as having obesity and they have metabolic syndrome or, or cardiometabolic issues. And then there's someone who is classified as having overweight or obesity, and they don't have metabolic issues and they're healthy. And then there's someone who is, uh, you know, quote unquote, normal weight, um, and they don't have any metabolic issues. So that's sort of the spectrum. And it's not, it's not so clean that someone just fits into one of those three categories. It exists all across. So that's, yeah. that's point one about why it's more complex. Yeah. And, and whether we're talking about you as an individual, we're talking about a client that you're working with or somebody you're arguing with on the internet, you know, you're not going to know just looking at someone where they fit on these spectrums, right? Like we've got to look at blood markers, biomarkers, blood pressure, um, you know, other indicators of health and wellness outside of their height weight ratio on this planet's relationship to gravity, which is what, you know, BMI is. Yes. Yes, for sure. You're listening to the better than fine podcast. I'm Darlene Marshall. Our guide on our quest today is Rich Fami, And we're talking about if dieting is all that bad. And so far in this episode, we've really mapped this idea of the question of dieting, what it is we're actually talking about, the different populations that might affect metabolic symptoms, social determinants of health. And I think Rich, are we to the point that we can look at this question of dieting, what we mean when we throw that out and why it might be bad <laughs> or we're, not? We're almost there. I've got a good one. Okay. I've you got, got one more. One. Okay. So the, Wind the, me up. The, 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 the second factor, and this one I don't think will make you as angry. So I think we're okay. Um, but if we need to talk through like a mindfulness exercise after we we're done need, taping, like a hug. We do then. Yes. We need a, we need one of those hug suits or something. Um, so, so here's one that's very physiological and the science nerds listening are going to like this one. 
but here's the bottom line is body fat is itself an endocrine organ. So we, we talk a lot about myokines, right? And then you, you alluded to that earlier as we talk about muscle as being an endocrine organ and they uh, release all these chemicals generally classified as myokines that have beneficial effects, you know, all across your physiology and um, including, you know, creating new connections in the brain, digestive, digestive health, immunity health, all kinds of things. So there is sort of a flip side to that in that body fat is not just, um, or let me back up a little bit. So muscles are not just there to make you move. They actually are signalers to all kinds of things. Body fat's the same. It's not just storage of energy. It also has, you know, one way to, to, it's been described as it has adipocytokines as an adipose tissue, right? So adipose cytokines. There's so many words that I have pronounced differently when I've seen them written because I've been saying myokines. So it's like, okay, myokines, adipose, adipose, myokines. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. I've (laughs) seen that too. Either way, I think, you know, we're okay. Um, the, (laughs) But so it's sort of, it's sort of two different, um, you know, endocrine organs, if you want to think about muscle versus, versus fat tissue. But the, the other problem with that is I can't just say, oh, you have more fat based on, you know, because your BMI is high and therefore you're going to have issues, um, because the distribution of fat is different from person to person, Mm -hmm. person to person. And, um, it's not uniform in composition or distribution. And those two things directly impact what kind of an endocrine organ your adipose tissue is. Um, adipose tissue participates in the regulation of a whole range of biological functions. Some of the big ones are coagulation, appetite, immunity, sugar and fat metabolism, reproduction, blood vessel formation, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So if um, your adipose tissue is disrupted either by its amount, distribution, or composition, it will have a negative impact on a whole bunch of systems. But I can't just say because you have more body fat, even based on a, a skin fold test or skin fold assessment, and definitely not BMI because BMI doesn't account for distribution of body fat at all or the type of fat you have or its composition. Or the type of weight at all. That, or the type of weight. Yeah, the type of weight. You could be just having extra muscle mass and, and therefore you're overweight on a you're classified as, as, as overweight on a BMI scale. But so what this means is not only is our relationship with weight and health complex, but body fat itself is incredibly complex and it will not behave the same way for every person just because they have more of it. So the strategy has to be tailored to the individual and the strategy cannot be weight focused. It has to be weight neutral and our interventions can't just be, Oh, lose weight, change your behavior. In every just, sense, just calorie strict. Um, so mm-hmm. I want to translate a little bit of that for the listener. So essentially, what I hear you saying is fat mass distributed around the body. And when you say composition, you mean that there are different types of fat mass and those behave differently metabolically. There might be different reasons for that composition. And all of these different factors together are going to affect. You know, if I if I really simplify what the endocrine system does, it's like hormones and signaling to all these different organ systems in the body. And so fat mass adipose tissue itself is active in this way. And there's a ton of variance. So we can't just say like, oh, I'll lose the fat and it's, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is spot wrong? on. So like, I don't know if I had a, a name chart with gold stars, I think you would have gotten... You would have Hooray! received somewhere around five gold stars. For Hooray! That. That's a perfect I like summary. stickers. I feel like yes. <laughs> I feel like there's a certain subset of our <laughs> listeners who are going to be like, "I want gold stars." I want a um, gold star. Gold stars. Gold stars to the listeners for jumping on our bandwagon. Um, okay, are we there? So we're there now. We're ready to talk about we're our there. diet. I, our yeah, diet's I, bad. <laughs> well, I think the better question <laughs> is, are diets effective? Because that's really what people are asking, right? Is, are they good or bad? Is you're asking a question about other, about their effectiveness. And so I think, yeah, I I, want to roll back that. I think there's probably a certain subset of our listeners 
who it's not necessarily our diets effective. It's maybe even our diets necessary. And I think what we've mm. qualified is what we've said is like, it depends, right? Mm. Like it depends on all these other factors. And that's why I think as a practitioner, you we've given this away, right? Like that's why it's a weight neutral approach. Like let's do all the things that make you healthy anyway. And your weight's going to land where it lands. Like take care of your meat machine here. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've said meat machine on the show before. It's a thing I say to Pretty clients cool. sometimes. <laughs> like it's the meat machine your consciousness rides around in. I, I like that. Yeah, like that. I'm a weirdo. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's that's so to me, that's the the first question is, are we focusing on the right thing? And then ultimately, if you as an individual decide like, yeah, maybe I do need to do some things about some things, then we get to this question of like, are diets effective? Sorry to hijack right. there. No, and that's all. It all works together, and it's all it's all copacetic. That's I've used right that here, word man. Maybe about ten months, um, but that's great. So, it, if we also, we probably should have a, an accepted definition of what we mean by diet. So, the definition yes. we're going to oh use goodness, here yes. is a specific food strategy where one restricts themselves for the purpose of losing body weight or for a medical reason. So, um, I think that's that's a pretty accepted definition of a diet. And I'm not talking about a healthy diet or anything like that. In, in a general sense, I'm talking about a diet for the purpose of losing weight. And it's usually characterized by temporary restriction. I want to add to that, that as fitness and wellness professionals, we are not qualified to do it for medical reasons. And it needs mm -hmm. that person that needs a medical, nutritional, dietary intervention needs to see a qualified dietitian, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, 100%. Cool. That's a great so disclaimer. We're going to put that over here too, in the same bucket as like, we're not talking about athletes. We're not talking about BMI over 40. We're not, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about like someone in my family asked me the other day, if a diet product that's being aggressively marketing when they watch football is a good idea. And I was like, no, because that is a supplement that is contraindicated for your medical problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. This is a diet, extreme calorie restriction. Um, yeah. Anyway. So. If we accept this definition of dieting, where do we go from here? Well, so I, th I think most of your listeners can agree that that there's a really high failure rate in this strategy. And in, in terms of the long term, I, I think most of the evidence out there is is that we can say with reasonable validity and certainty is that just about any diet will create weight loss in the short term. But the overwhelming evidence, emphasis on the word overwhelming, is that they do not work in the long term. There's there's lots of variance in the numbers that I was able to find. And a lot of that, that variation comes in um, its relation to the time that someone's measuring, that they're, yeah. they're measuring the effectiveness of a diet, and um, the amount of, of weight that has been regained. So... And some of the issue with research is that they only follow someone for about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And that may give you the false impression of success, of long-term success. But kind of the, the some of the numbers I found were that 95% 90 of dieters will regain the weight they lost within two years. And 80% of dieters will regain the weight they lost and gain more than their starting point in three years. So is this an effective strategy for long-term weight loss in the interest of health and well-being? Absolutely not. And I don't know that many people would even fight that in at I, this day and age. I don't know. I feel like I could find you some people on Instagram that'll have a real good fight about it. <laughs> um, and that's part of why I, 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 I'm sure you noticed I was taking some big deep breaths while you reviewed the statistics mm -hmm. because I get in this argument all the time with other fitness professionals where, okay, you're out there pushing weight loss, pushing weight loss, pushing weight loss. And sure, you could calorie restrict somebody for six months and give them some aggressive hit, high intensity interval training. And that scale pound is going to go down. But what happens when you stop? And I don't know if you've listened to Rick Ritchie's episode about, um, the diet drugs that are typically, excuse me, the diabetic maintenance drugs that are typically prescribed to diabetics that are now being used for aggressive weight loss uh, mm -hmm. in Hollywood. It's very like all over the place, these Hollywood diet drugs. And that as soon as you stop those drugs, as soon as you stop the supplements, as soon as you stop the calorie restriction, 
not only does the weight come on, but it's not uncommon for you to end up heavier than you were. And whatever metabolic damage you did in the meantime got worse. So you're more likely to develop metabolic syndrome. And then all that stuff mm. we said at the beginning happens because of the, I'm trying not to curse, short-term strategy that you employed because somebody saying that weight loss is a good idea pushed you into a non-evidence-based, long-term, unhealthy strategy. Why are we doing this as an industry? Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Big breath. And rant 38 of this I episode. Felt it. I felt it start. I'm like, I can't hold it back anymore, Rich. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't stop this. This, this train's so rolling. Red. I'm so, um, I feel somebody take a screen grab from YouTube of this and shame me. This. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you knew this, this topic would, would, would get I you know, all but we have bothered. to talk about it. And then we, we want to talk do. about it because you're someone that I respect so much who I know oh. was going to come in here with real science and data and that you bother to do the research. And now every time I get some stupid DM, I'm just going to send them the link to this. Because I, I can't have this conversation every three days and feel like nobody's listening. That sounds like a plan to me. Make it easy. Just put the link in a form uh, message and just send it out. Um, okay, the, blood pressure restabilize. So, <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, um, you mentioned a couple of things that I think that are worth expanding on. Um, the yo-yo dieting, uh, I didn't do a lot of research on this, but I did catch some stuff about yo-yo yo-yo dieting being metabolically harmful. So it's it's yo-yo dieting too in case someone isn't sure what that means. That that is that is the repeated employing of diet strategies as we've defined here and it's creating that cycle of weight loss and regain, weight loss and regain, weight loss and regain and that does create metabolic issues and um, not surprisingly can make you know managing your health um, harder with every subsequent cycle of that. I, the, um, so not only is that physiologically harmful, but a focus on weight is harmful. And I, and one of the things that you did such a great show, um, with Katie Hake, I hope I'm saying her name correctly yeah, is yeah. on the strategy of intuitive eating. And that actually has some really good, um, evidence around it that you get, not only an improvement in the things that we look at with those cardiometabolic markers, such as um, improved blood pressure, triglycerides, um, but also reduced anxiety and depression. Their preoccupation with food uh, is reduced. Shame and guilt over eating behaviors is reduced. Self-esteem self is improved. Self-compassion is improved. Self-acceptance is improved. And uh, overall satisfaction with life is improved as well as healthy eating behaviors. Yeah. So I don't, I, you know, weight loss strategies that are comprised of diets do not show yeah. those results. In fact, they show the inverse of a lot Opposite. of those results. And yeah. we say all the time on this show, shame, blame, and guilt, the three horsemen of the wellness mm -hmm. apocalypse. <laughs> um, and I think what you highlight there is if we are looking for a truly holistic approach to nutrition that supports long-term wellness and well-being, dieting doesn't work not only that it doesn't work for the thing it's being sold for, it doesn't work on all these other things. And so I want to plug a few other things. You mentioned Katie Hake. Um, we have two episodes on intuitive eating. The episode with Katie Hake is about the ideas around intuitive eating. And there's a second episode a few weeks later that was an audience request that we go through the 10 principles of intuitive eating. There was also a great article in the New York Times this past week about the journey of intuitive eating into the world, the scientific evidence underneath it. Um, it's an interview with its two creators. And I, I highly recommend any of those resources for people who are looking for something that actually does work. Um, but just a, a quick plug, it's a completely different way of approaching nutrition toward your wellness and well-being than the diet culture that we have all, myself included, been raised in and are now in the active process of deprogramming because we've got decades of evidence that show it just doesn't work. It's not helping us. Is there anything that you would like to add to that, Rich? No, that's a great summary. I, I think if we had to, to bottom line this, 
It really is take a weight neutral approach with intuitive eating. And even though the goal of intuitive, intuitive eating does not have anything to do with reducing your weight, it is actually a better strategy for weight loss if that is your objective. Um, and it, it, what we understand about fat as an endocrine organ and muscle as an endocrine organ actually underscores the importance of movement, which we've talked about several times that, you know, really if, if we're looking at improving your health and well-being, weight loss for its own sake is not the strategy. The strategy is improving your relationship with food, your understanding of what food does for your body and moving in a way that's enjoyable. So all these things, that's the strategy you should take because that actually creates long-term outcomes. So there's your punchline. It's beautiful. I love the punchline. Um, thank you so much for, you know, I, when I floated this idea to you, I felt like I was giving you a big assignment when you're already such a busy person and you've taken it so seriously. Um, you, you know what this means to me personally. I think that you probably know what this means to our listeners. Um, and I also just want to add for listeners who are looking for education with this lens, um, Rich was the product management lead on the wellness coaching certification, um, that I talk about on the show all the time, because I really do believe in it. Um, and was very intentional in building the certification toward these principles. And if you are looking for something that backs it up, that's, that's the best plug I can give. But these ideas mean so much to me. And so thank you so much for being the vehicle, because clearly I just would have ranted for 40 minutes and it wouldn't have been a very <laughs> informative episode. <laughs> So I'm happy to do it. And I'm, I'm happy you chose me for the assignment. So I'm, I am grateful. And I'm yeah. so happy to, to be here and have this talk. Thank you so much. Um, and to our listeners, we would love to hear any feedback that you have about this episode. So if this episode was impactful for you, if you got impassioned about it, you want to talk to me about it, don't hesitate to reach out. You can email me. It's info at darlene.coach. I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. My Instagram is darlene.coach. And I also have a Substack. It's coachdar.substack.com. It's titled More Better. And it's essentially taking the principles and practices that we talk about on this show and making them easy to reference. So you can find that there. If you're a fan of the show. I hope you're already subscribed. And if this show has helped you and supported you in any way, one of the best things that you can do to help us would be to either leave a review or share it with somebody that you know, who maybe could use some evidence-based uh, gut checking information about dieting and what it's actually doing to their health. So thank you so much for listening to the show. We'd love to hear from you and be well.